All right. So preparing for the National Registry, we've talked a lot about getting involved with having a plan, study guide, a time limit you put on yourself, and with uh, changing some of the daily practices you have, like getting rid of Facebook and things like that. Right now, I want to delve into a specific subject of cardiology. So cardiology, depending on where you work, is going to be about 46 to 47 percent of your call volume. Like, that's it down here in the South. Like, we were just talking about Big Daddy's and well, we got a JJ's fish and chicken and God dang Bojangles. So 850,000 people per year in the U.S. die because of cardiovascular disease. It's the number one killer of people in the U.S. Why? Poor diets, sedentary lifestyles. They don't exercise. You know, crap like that. So worldwide, 17 million per year die because of a uh, cardiovascular disease. It's a big, big call volume component for us in EMS pre-hospital. So one of the things we talk about <clears throat> is the structural anatomy of the heart. It's got a, you know, four chambers, atria on top, ventricles on the bottom. The atria receive blood, the ventricles push blood out. And it is run off of electricity that has four different cardiac cell characteristics, meaning that we have automaticity, the ability to create electricity, excitability, meaning that the cell can be stimulated. Then we have another one called conductivity, where we can transfer that energy to the cell next to us, and then contractility, where the cell and the heart muscles can expand, contract, and push blood out of it. Now, we talked about some of the bigger issues that you face in the EMS world in, in regards to acute coronary syndrome. MIs, CHF, left and right-sided heart failure. These are big issues that we run into a lot and very often. Now, reminder, we can't be out here playing paragon because only about 40-something percent of people actually show EKG changes on a 12-lead. There are people that don't even have chest pain. This is why I've always encouraged all of you to 12-lead everybody. You'll find things. Do a full physical assessment on everybody. You'll find things. So, I want to share my screen now. And here we are. So the registry is notorious for asking about leads in the artery involved, which means if it's a lead 2-3 AVF and indicating a possible inferior myocardial infarction, the what artery is involved? We're talking about the right coronary artery because it's on the right side of the heart. So registry likes to ask those questions. So other signs that we might have a right ventricular infarct would be what? JVD, hypotension. Got to be careful when you're given an inferior MI. Vasodilators like nitro. But to be honest, every any true blue inferior MI that had posterior wall involvement, they had a low blood pressure anyway, so I wouldn't have considered nitro. But there are some medics that want to chance it and go ahead and give nitro to inferior MIs. If you're going to do that, you need to have fluids going so that the pressure is already being lifted and that preload, that volume is being filling that tank. So cardiac output, as you may remember, is what? Heart rate times stroke volume. Heart rate times stroke volume. So stroke volume being the amount of blood pumped out by the ventricle with each beat and minute volume or the heart rate being the amount of contractions that occur within that minute. So if heart rate times stroke volume is what cardiac output is, cardiac output would be how much blood is coming out of the heart in a minute. And is it able to be enough to meet the metabolic demands of the body? Is it enough to perfuse the brain, the heart, the lungs? Because those guys need constant blood flow, constant blood flow versus like, believe it or not, your skeletal muscle tissue can take a couple hours of a tourniquet. They will put a tourniquet on in the OR operating room four or five hours on a person's leg or arm and they can restore perfusion and blood flow. And it's not that big a deal, but the heart, lung, and brain can't go without, can't go without. So the big time we, the big problem we can run into about with the heart is, is it going too fast? Is it going too slow? Well, volume, is there enough blood and fluid to meet the organ needs or is the force contraction not strong enough to squish all the blood out? That's a problem with congestive heart failure is that the number one cause of left side of heart failure is a heart attack, an MI. So that being the case, there's dead ventricular meat there. Does dead meat beat? No, it does not. So it doesn't also conduct electricity. 
It also does not become excitable. It also does not conduct or contract anymore. It is dead meat. It doesn't do anything but lay there and be useless. Kind of like station 16. Oh, no shots fired. Shots fired? I remember station 16 leaving me high and dry one night. I ain't never forgave him. Not once, not ever. Will I forgive station 16 for that audacious treatment of me? So we got too fast, too slow. We need to divulge in how to bring that thing down. So fix the problem as it presents. So dead meat doesn't beat. Well, it can cause a backup, backup of blood to flow back into the lungs, and we have pulmonary edema happening. It can be a flash pulmonary edema. It could be gradual. It really depends on the patient, their presentation, the variables that are involved in them. So dead meat does not meet. Now, why do we have patients that will, that will display a ST elevation myocardial infarction? Why there's actually EKG changes? Well, remember, water, air, electricity, all of them follow the path of least resistance. We use the term aberrancy. If an electrical conduction or impulse travels, hits an area of dead meat, it cannot go through it because it does not conduct anymore. It does not transfer the energy to the next cell. Those cells are dead. What does it do? Travels up and over it. That creates what? Our ST elevation. It's finding a ways around. So what if you got a patient with a slow heart rate? symptomatic sinus bradycardia, junctional escape, second degree type one, two, third degree idioventricular. You got options. So for sinus brady, junctional escape, or second degree type one, you can consider atropine, one milligram, max of three. That don't work, we're going to go to pacing. That don't work, we will go to a presser, dopamine drip, epinephrine drip. Those are the options. A way to remember that. I don't mean to be crude, but I do. What is the format we're going to use? I'll give it to you now. Can I do it? Got to get my pen out. Pen. A, T, D, E, atropine, transcutaneous pacing, dopamine, and epinephrine. All tits droop eventually. A, T, D, E, all tits droop eventually. So your flow chart would be what, atropine? Then try pacing, then try dopamine, then try epinephrine. You're trying all these things before what? Before you have to shock them. So pacing will be the shocking though. But you know what? It only actually captures about 40% of the time. So some patients that you're trying to pace with pads, it won't work. Why? Dead meat doesn't beat. It can't travel through dead tissue, depending on where the heart, the MI is at and where the dead tissue is at. So next option you would have is a dopamine drip. See if that works. After that, epinephrine is your guy. Now, what if you don't care dopamine like most of you don't? Epinephrine drip will be your go-to. But remember, atropine is only going to work for sinus brady, a junctional escape, or a first or a second degree type one. It won't work for a second degree type two, third degree, or ventricular. So what does the second degree type two and the third degree look like? We're saying that it's going to just go ahead and jump straight to pacing. If the pacing doesn't work, you can jump straight to a vasopressor, dopamine or epinephrine. So think about it. A third degree, complete heart block. There's nothing that's going to increase that conduction velocity through that AV node because the AV node is completely blocking any impulse. You have to have some type of medication or outside stimuli to increase that heart rate to be successful in increasing the patient's cardiac output. So a visual on that, symptomatic bradycardia, try atropine, try pacing, that don't work. Try dopamine, that don't work. You can try the epi, but I would advise you against trying both. Either do epi or dopamine, don't do both. Let me say that again, do not do both. Might as well just put a bullet in the patient if you're gonna do all that. So let, wake up. 
forgot you was an old man. Fall asleep in a chair. After he eats. After he eats. All you got to do is turn the TV up. I'm watching that. He's right back there. <laughs> I was just resting my eyes. I wouldn't even sleep. I wouldn't even sleep. All right, so we talked about heart blocks. First degree AV blocks, not even really a heart block. It's really just a delay in conduction, meaning the PB, PR interval is actually just longer than five blocks long. So anything between three and five is normal. Anything greater than five is a first degree heart block. It is not an actual rhythm. It is just a, an addition to a rhythm. So this could be a sinus rhythm with a first degree heart block, but the rhythm's name is not first degree heart block. It's still a sinus rhythm. Next, we have second degree type two, which is your winky bot, longer, longer, longer drop. We have a progressively longer and longer PR interval until we have a completely dropped beat. Completely dropped beat. So that is the winky bot. Next, we have the third degree or the high degree heart block. So second degree type two or third degree. So Secondary type two and third degree. You're going to need to start with pacing. Atropine will not work. You'll have to just go straight to pacing. If that's not happening, consider sedation. But also, if you're going to pace them, consider sedation because it's going to hurt. But then do a dopamine drip at 5 to 20 mics per kg or do an epi drip 2 to 10 mics per minute. How do you make an epi drip? Well, one milligram, one to 1,000 epinephrine in a 250 cc bag with a 60 drop set can give you four mics a minute. I would start there and see what happens. What about a patient that's exhibiting signs of AFib? Atrial fibrillation. We have a stable and unstable. Now, in other states that give a crap about their patients, you have the option to administer a calcium channel blocker. They give it out like candy for these things because... For a stable AFib, you can just give a piece of some medicine and the patient will calm down. So the drug of choice is diltiazem or cardiazem. Diltiazem or cardiazem. The dose is listed there. And for unstable, you would have to consider sedation and cardioversion. Now, let me remind you, AFib, if you cardiovert AFib, you take a risk that those clots that have been forming in that quivering atria once you hit them with that electricity, they're going to shoot all out. That could be an MI, that could be a stroke, that could be a PE. That's a risk you're taking. So in the Fulton County guidelines, you don't have a calcium channel blocker. And it says you can cardiovert, but it's written in red. What does that mean? That means call a physician. I've never had them tell me to cardiovert. Pretty much. They're going to give them cardiovert once you get to the ER. Yes, sir. Most of the time, though, let's say it was a, a stable acute AFib that just occurred. Well, there's no way to really know if it's acute or not. That Most patients are not aware of their own heart rate or heartbeat or whatever. They're not aware of it. So that would be an option and an issue that we would run in. SVT. Supraventricular tachycardia. So common thing we run into would be, was it stable versus unstable? We've got to ask that question anytime we look at a rhythm. Stable meaning that they got really no complaints. They just feel kind of funny and lightheaded, dizzy, something like that. You can try vagal maneuvers like a valsalva maneuver, have them blow into a straw. That air gets a closed glottis, will stimulate the 10th cranial nerve to release a set of choline to interrupt the synapse at the heart of the AV node so it can slow the heart rate down. Then you could try adenosin. Adenosin has a 10 second half life. You must slam it and flush it with 10 to 20 cc's right after. First dose, six milligrams, second dose, 12. That is if they're stable. If somebody is unstable, they have chest pain, difficulty breathing, decreased level of conscious, or hemodynamically unstable, meaning that their blood pressure is low. That means they're not able to meet the metabolic demands of their body. Their blood pressure is low. They're not feeding their brain. They're not feeding their heart. They're not feeding their lungs. They are considered unstable. It goes straight where? To cardioversion. To say, sedate them as you would want for yourself because you're about to kick them in the chest with a electric mule. I have done it and it looked unpleasant. If you have time, start an IV and give some sedation. But if they're about to like, you know, fly off to Jesus, pad, pad, juice them. It may hurt, but they will live. So you know, a lot of the patients I've done this to and with, 
actually knew that they needed to have it done. Hey, they try and push the medicine every time it doesn't work. They usually have to just shock me. Well, fair. Thank you, good citizen. I know what to do. And I'm going to be honest with you. Every, every time I've done it, I had a few butterflies. It's not something you kind of do all the time. It's not something that's comfortable. You're about to electrocute another human being. So it's okay to have some butterflies, but it's not okay to not be aggressive enough to even try it. It's picture perfect painted. Blood pressure is 90 over 40. Patients got chest pain. They're, they're kind of woozy. They're not feeling good. They're having some trouble breathing. They're unstable. Pad, pad, Georgia Power. It's, it is anxiety. It'll, it'll be there. But, so, uh, all right, so quick. Okay. Oh, both of them are asking the question now. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, synchronized cardio version is in joules, and that's where you start. Yes. Sir. Pacing was in milliamps. So, right? That's right. Think of it like the difference between a 45 caliber pistol and a 22. The joules is the 45. Bang. Pacing, you start at 25 milliamps. You start at 20 milliamps, increase by 10 every 10 seconds mm -hmm. until you get captured. Mm -hmm. You'll set your rate about 70 to 80, so you have that rate set there. But again, that's only electrical capture. You make to ensure that you got mechanical capture by feeling a mechanical pulse. And plus 10 every 10 seconds. So I know the jewels, I know the jewels range, and then I start over range to the FDT, right? So I understand it for 10 person with the range one from 50 to 360. Mm hmm. You? It depends on your biphasic versus monophasic monitor that you're using. Depending on what monitor you're using, well, the joule settings will be different. Now, luckily for you, on each monitor is written the joule settings for each subsequent um, dose of defibrillation. But the good starting place for most adults is between is about 150. And on our monitor, it kind of makes it foolproof, right? When you click on you would think cardio. When you click on cardio, it it I don't have to turn it to joules or millions. It's already yes. by clicking it to cardio versus single. Oh yeah, yeah. Pacing, yeah. It does it for you. So when you go to pace and hit the pace button, it switches to milliamps. Million. So it takes the the dumb fireman out of it. You know? well, I was just Somebody that Let me tell you, uh, the times I've done it, it was like the heart getting a little bit of that get right. right back here. Usually only took one good oh, slap, man. but there, there are patients that you got to keep hitting and eventually they can convert. They might need some pharmacological assistance that's only provided to the ER. Mm. I've never had that personally, but I've had friends that had it happen. There's this one woman that they just had to keep hitting. But so if you do a brain, it's just like, I mean, you may start at that 150, you do that. Blue, it's all safe spot, right? And you zap them. And so like, for oh, cardio yeah, version, so for cardio version, you'll start at between, depending on their size, all these other variables, but I always start at 100, then move up to 120, 150, 200. You'll shock in a stepwise fashion, getting farther and farther, more jewels, more jewels, more jewels. I don't think I've ever had to go over 200, though. Because, again, that one, get right, is usually enough for the heart to be like, all right, I'm good. Here's your money. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's usually enough to do it. But if you have time, please give them some sedation because you would want it, I promise, because it's, it's not going to tickle. It ain't going to tickle at all. Well, define when you have time because, you know, it takes a minute to get that medicine. So there, we're talking about stable versus unstable, gotcha. right? So if they're kind of in that mid range, they're stable ish, but heading towards unstable, you got a little time. You can start an IV and push the the verse set on them. And think about it, if you had if you had stable in like you already had IV access to you know probably decided to slam Dennis in the first. Yep. So the key word for us on the test is gonna be you know, look for that word stable versus it's not gonna say the word stable. It it's gonna say patients got chest pain, a decreased level of consciousness, the blood pressure is eighty over forty. That's unstable. That's exactly, they're not going to say he's stable or unstable. They're going to give you a set of vitals and a set of symptoms. It is your job to determine if they're stable or unstable. So it'd be a good idea to make peace with this. If there's chest pain, remember cardiac output is dependent on what? Heart rate times stroke volume. If the heart rate's this fast, the heart can't refill. In the first place the heart 
does when it pumps blood out is it feeds itself, goes in the coronary arteries. Now they're having chest pain because this, not refilling, no coronary artery filling. They're getting, they're losing consciousness because there's no blood going to the brain. They're, they're starting to have trouble breathing because there's no blood going to the lungs. So cardiac output is going to be what determines their quality of life there. So for you, they're having chest pain, difficulty breathing, decreased level of consciousness, or the blood pressure is falling. They're not meeting the metabolic demands of their body. If they're unstable, hit them. But even on the stable range, are they going to be stable for very long? No. Can you have a heart rate of 185, 190 for a long time and be able to refill adequately? No. no. They will eventually be unstable. So if they are more stable, try the vagal. Try the adenosine. Be gentle first. Then if that don't work, light them up. Georgia Power. But if they're already unstable, float to the go ahead and light them up. Remember to sink the cardio burden. Otherwise, it's a defibrillation and you will kill him. Thanks. Think of defibrillation like a, a, a nuclear bomb. You're going to hit everything. A cardio version is like a sniper shot. Very precise. It's very precise. Let's talk about some VTAC. Science does a lot of cool stuff. VTAC with a pulse. Stable versus unstable. Stable is I feel funny. I'm lightheaded. I can feel my pulse racing. Oh, no. Your answer to this is, oh, amiodarone. 150 over 10 minutes. 100 cc bag. 10 drops a minute. Yes. We're only talking about monomorphic, which is that all of them look the same. So if they're stable, you can hit them with that amiodarone. Drill. 150, 100 cc bag over 10 minutes will give you about 10 drops a minute. You don't carry procainamide, you don't carry soda law. But this is NASA registry, so know that they are options for unstable for stable VTAC. And procainamide is a calcium channel blocker as well. Procainamide is a sodium channel blocker. Sodium. Lidocaine, procainamide, all them cane boys, they all belong in sodium channel blocker range. Now, soda law. Sounds like a beta blocker because LOL, but it's not. It's a sneaky little turd that is actually a potassium channel blocker. I'd never heard of it before 2020. I've never seen it, and I don't know anybody that carries it around here. But again, this is National Registry, not Atlanta. So potassium, sodium, no, soda oil is potassium, procainamide, and lidocaine on. Sodium channel blockers and the others are calcium channel blockers. Let's see. Procainamide, sodium, sodalol, potassium, amiodarone is potassium. Let's write that down. Amiodarone is potassium channel blocker. Procainamide is a sodium channel blocker. And sodalol be another potassium channel blocker. Oh yeah. Now if they're unstable, remember if they're if they're too fast, we got to put on the brakes. So we're going to run over there to cardioversion, synchronized cardioversion. How do I know if they're unstable? Chest pain. Difficulty breathing, decreased level of consciousness, low blood pressure. They could also be pale, cool, clammy because they're in some type of shock. So we'll go ahead and sedate if we can, but if not, go ahead and just light them up. Try 100, then 2, then 3, then 360 joules. Usually after that first shot, the heart gets a lot of get right. I'm sorry. I only know I was acting crazy. My bad. I was just hungry or something, you know? You know how it is. All right, pulseless VTAC and V-fib. This is the shockable rhythms, pulseless VTAC and V-fib. So you need to go ahead and start CPR. You need to go ahead and put them on a monitor. You got shock zones there. But the main thing is, is that this one gets epinephrine and it gets amiodarone. Starting dose for amiodarone for this will be what? 300 milligrams. The following dose will come later. It will be 150 for a max of 450. Always consider H's and T's. Why? 
reversible causes. So you can try and fix and, and beat this thing. Assistly and PEA. PEA. So really, this gets epi and CPR. H's and T's, faith, hope, and love. Later. Do not let registry trick you. <clears throat> they like to do this. I like to do it too. I'll give you a nice cardiac rhythm and give you a little scenario. Patient is pulseless, blah, 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 but it's like a normal sinus rhythm there. What is it? Yeah. It's PEA. They will trick you. I will trick you. I like to do it. It's fun. You have to watch for that. So, a Sicily and PEA get epi, CPR, IV, intubation, H's and T's. And then what, what happens? It runs in a circle. Change compressors every two minutes. Make sure the compressions are 100, 120 compressions per minute. Two inches depth. Allow for adequate chest recoil. That's really about it. Circle around. Rinse and repeat. Keep it on flowing. Me like it long time. I wonder why they never, I don't know what thing you think about this now, but when you get a super glide, like say you put a, a um, eye gel in, you know how like with the, uh, the bougie or the stylet? What do you call me? You call me bougie. Like once they should make it so like it unscrews it and you could put your innovation key right there and then pull out the. Uh... So you can use an eye gel to get the airway first and use a, a, a bougie. And then as you get the bougie in the trachea, you can pull the eye gel off and slide the ET tube on. That is a thing. It's just more of a blind insertion because you can't see, but you can feel. The bougie will actually scrape those tracheal rings. You can feel it bumping. Do, 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 do. Kind of like, you know, if like this surface right here, you kind of have that bumps against it, you'll feel it bumping like that. Tell me about this other EKG stuff. So a digitalis effect is if a patient's been prescribed digitalis, which is purple fox glove, it's a flower. It is normally given to patients that have a chronic, a fib, a flutter. And they have what's called a digitalis sag. Ooh, you sag. So what happens is it starts to, have a sag right there. They could have digitalis toxicity. There is a reversal agent known as digibind. Digital monsters. Nobody? In my 90s kids? Oh, y'all old as hell, ain't you? You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You're a 90s parent. So you know Digimon. <laughs> well, I grew up in the 90s. Ash, Pokemon. Oh, I'm a little boy now. <laughs> That's what we did in middle school. Trade Pokemon cards. Hell yeah. Did you have an ash for a Halloween costume? I did not. My son did. I mean, I wasn't that cool. I had to go like, I, we was poor. I, I went wrapped in tinfoil. I'm, 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 a, I'm a baked potato. Party city. <laughs> <laughs> they have no party city in South Georgia. I can go as a baked potato or a farm hand, which is what I was. So talking about that Delta wave, we got Wolf Parkinson White. Think of a Delta... Air wing, which one of y'all work? Airport. It's like a Delta fixed wing, don't it? Tail wing, whatever it's called. So with Wolf Parkinson White, there's an accessory pathway that uh, will innervate the ventricles through another pathway that can be activated and form this Delta wave. So we have a shortened PR interval, a slurred Q wave, and a widened QRS complex, giving us the perfect little Delta wave. Now, the danger with Wolf Parkinson White is it can turn into a rebound high, uh, rebound tachycardia that will damage and hurt the patient. So the gatekeeper is the AV node. And if you try and, like, let's say, push amiodarone or a adenosine on this Wolf Parkinson White patient, it blocks the AV node, which gives dominance to that bundle of Kent, and this patient will go into a rebound tachycardia that you might not can stop. So Wolf Parkinson White, don't give them adenosine or it could kill them. I wouldn't either. And what about the Osborne or the J-wave? This is normally seen in hypothermia. This is normally seen in hypothermia, a patient that is experiencing an Osborne or a J-wave. So honestly, a lot of the registry questions I've seen have all kind of teetered back asking questions like, which of the following conditions would present with a Delta wave? Well, that'd be Wolf Parkinson White. That was the entire question. Didn't ask me to read one or anything, but it did have the, uh, you know, just the, the 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 words of it there. But at the psychomotor registry, there has been lately a couple of these uh, Wolf Parkinson White rhythms popping up. 
usually the the status the 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 what's it called oh, don't. the static cardiology static cardiology it'll give you pretty simple straightforward rhythms but lately they've been doing delta waves the tech school you went to yeah we had that conversation because that was that was news to me that they would have a delta wave on there because normally it's like here's a sinus tack um here's like a an inferior MI, like it's usually here's a, a monomorphic VTAC. It's like much more simpler rhythm, but registry again is evolving. Now, I don't think the J is doing it in the audio. You don't? It's just, nice. a, it's just a nickname for it because I think the guy's name was something, something Osborne. Oh, okay. I like it. And there's your Wolf Parkinson White looking all Delta wavy. Delta wave in the wind. What the hell would you actually do if you got a patient back from a cardiac arrest? It's kind of funny to me watching a new medical scene. I don't know what to do with my hands. I didn't expect to get this far, really. So how do you manage your ROSC patient? Well, let's talk about it. You've got to return to spontaneous circulation. You have to optimize ventilation and oxygenation. Now, ventilation is air moving in and out. Oxygenation is the actual saturation of oxygen molecules binding to hemoglobin. We got them. We got a pulse back. Let's keep the thing. Let's do that. So, how do you manage ventilation? Well, you've got capnography. Managing that capnography between, between 35 and 40 will do what? Protect the patient. It brings them to that normal ish, -ish level of what their capnography would be anyway. Now, we're looking to titrate O2 sat up to about 94%. Anything over 94 is good. So make sure you got the O2 set up at 94. Now, what about the blood pressure? You must not let them be hypotensive. Now, a lot of times when you get a patient back, that rhythm will be a reperfusion rhythm. It'll be big, fast. It'll be big and slow and wide because the heart's barely beating. You know why? You just beat the hell out of it for however long that patient was arrested. Think about it. You just beat the hell out of that heart. If we, if we was to take one of these recruits outside and just beat the hell out of them, you think he's going to work really hard tomorrow? No. He's going to limp around here. Huh? No, they're not. <laughs> they, they do yoga and stuff nowadays. <laughs> Much softer department. Exhausting. I saw the her video. Yeah? Yeah. Interesting. So my point is, though, is you just beat the heart up. You just squished it between the sternum and the backbone 100 to 120 times a minute for the last however long. <laughs> it's bruised been done wrong so it's not gonna want to do a whole lot so usually there's a, when the when you get a rhythm back it might be slower pace it or give it some type of pressure so they're also because it's slower it may have a lower blood pressure you want that systolic blood pressure to be about 90 you want the map or the mean arterial pressure which is the actual measure of the perfusion to all the organs to be about 60 65 how do you do that IVIO access, you can try fluids or pressors, norepi, which is levofed, epinephrine drip, epi drip, or a dopamine drip. You can then try and identify and treat underlying causes. If you don't find H's and T's, you ever went into your garden or your yard, if you have one, chopped the head off of a weed, what happened? It came back, right? You pulled up by its roots, though. Did it come back? No. This is the same thing. Don't just, you got a pulse back, yay. But why did they go into arrest? If you don't fix that problem, they'll do it again. So be looking for the reversible causes. Next, run a 12 lead on them. Did they go into arrest because they had a STEMI or, or, or an MI of some sort? Check what their coronary perfusion is. And then can they follow verbal commands? Are they starting to come conscious again? If so, knock them down. I don't want you waking up and ruining all my hard work. If you have a patient that you have arrest worked in a rest on. You've probably intubated them, right? And if they start waking up, what are they going to do? They're going to try and extubate themselves. So tie their hands, knock them down, and make sure that they are going to be okay. Then talk about targeted tent management, which is we're going to use therapeutic hypothermia to reduce the metabolic demands of the body, be, car be cardio and neurovascularly protective. It will protect the brain, and also a lot of that acidosis will be inoculated. So cool them down, cool them down. Questions about that? Ice packs. Yeah, hopefully you have at least some ice packs. 
Yeah, put them in the um the axillary, the groin, behind the neck. That's about all you can do. I don't know about you, but I don't think I have what two or three ice packs per truck. It ain't a lot. They're thinking that we got a bunch of big old ice maker machines back there, but that's just not the case. That is just not the case. They were at a restaurant. Well, there's that. Josh, yes, no sir. lifestyle I know is to put the ice pack. I know it's. Well, and John is a fancy word for chest pain. Let me remind you, the only way to really know somebody's having an MI is to do a blood test. Look for troponin levels to be elevated. When the heart's stressed, it will drop troponin in the bloodstream. So let's not be one of those medics out here playing God. Well, here's the EKG's clean. He's not having no chest pain. He's just an old bum. I've had them trick, trick people before. I've told you all the story about the old dude I used to pick up all the time. He just wanted a turkey sandwich and a flirt with big booty nurses. But I always treated him for chest pain, 12 lead, IV, aspirin. It didn't hurt him. His blood pressure was high as hell anyway. Nitro. One day he wasn't kidding. This, this is hard to do. But trust me on this. I don't care if this is a frequent flyer you see every day. The only way to know if they're really having an OMI is to do a blood test. And since we can't do that in the pre-hospital, treat them for chest pain. Thank me later. Also, if you see the same person every day, always be thorough. Do that head-to-toe thing. Do not let them sneak one by you. The one day you ain't looking for it, something will happen. I know it's hard, especially if you see the same people all the time. I used to go over there by Station 30 all the time and see that one woman. Can't use names on recording. And we wouldn't do that anyway. Ever. <laughs> but we all know her, know who her name is, and very familiar, you know. And um, but one day she wasn't playing. One day she wasn't. Who remembers that guy that used to sing all the time? I ain't going to say his name. He's in Atlanta. Homeless guy. Actually had a very golden voice. No. No, it wasn't him. Anyway, he always called for some bull crap. But one day, hey, man, Cerner Rub, nothing. I checked dude's sugar. It was 30. He was a bad diabetic. I'd never seen him actually bottom out like that, though. Gave him that old D50. He came roaring back. As soon as I woke him up, he was back there just singing to me. I've been loving you too long. I'm dead serious. And it was pleasant. He had a good voice. And um, he hung out by that bar downtown where there's a lot of karaoke and stuff. I, I mean, he's a good guy, you know. We got we to gotta get out of the mindset. He's a homeless person. No, he's removed the word homeless. He's a person. His choices in, in life, whatever, whatever happened, he's there where he is. Still treat him with love and respect. But don't let these folks trick you because you see them all the time. I know it's hard, especially if you burn out and you don't take time for yourself. So angina, usually a result of what? Arthrosclerosis, atherosclerosis, and arteriosclerosis. Remember, don't mix the two. Arteriosclerosis, art hardens, paint hardens. That is the hardening of the arteries. And athro is the buildup of sclerotic plaque, plaque buildup. What we talked about earlier, Bojangles, JJ's Fish and Chicken, Big Daddy's, American Deli. Actually, that sounds pretty good, actually. How dare you? Go help recruit. You disgust me. Not around here. All right. I win. So we got three categories. Stable angina. This is old people who has heart chest pain from time to time, but because it really creates a supply and demand issue. He stresses his heart and he has to go on out there. He let's say he's out there pushing, doing the push mower, cutting grass. Oh, chest hurts. God dang. I need to sit down. Woo. Damn. So he sits there after he rests a few minutes, maybe pops one nitro or so. It goes away. That's stable. He fixed it. Basically, he just exerted himself too much. Unstable is he could be sitting there watching TV and it just hits him and it starts getting worse. And he takes nitro and it doesn't get any better. Unstable is classified anything lasting over 20 minutes. Stable is classified as if it could be fixed in under 20 minutes. That's a pretty easy way to designate him, right? But what about variant or spasmodic angina? This is the, the guy that done crack. Basically, the coronary arteries have spasm closed like this because 
you had a stimulant in there. Too much crack can kill you. It'll cause an MI. So don't smoke crack, kids, okay? Remember that damn drug line used to come around, dare guy? Every one of y'all done failed him, Ace. You failed him. You probably signed like a, I promise not to do drugs, little sheet or something. Bunch of liars. I failed him too. It's okay. So it could go away spontaneously or it could not. So how are we going to treat these people? Well, we're going to give that old Mona Fona. What's that mean? Morphine, 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 oxygen, nitro, aspirin. So morphine, oxygen, nitro, aspirin. Doesn't even have to be in that order, but you got to be remembering a lot of places got rid of morphine. They go with the fentanyl. What do you need to give them first? Aspirin. 25%. Let me tell you this. I think I told your class. 2019 ESO did a study. Patients that received aspirin earlier had a 25% higher chance of not dying. Hit them with that aspirin. You got any allergies, buddy? All right, no, eat this. Eat the aspirin. It stops the clock from getting bigger. Also, within the first few minutes of meeting that patient, they should be on a 12 lead. The cleanest 12 lead you'll have probably be on scene before you get bumping and grinding down the road. But ain't nothing wrong <clears throat> with a little bump and grind. But going down the road, that's more challenging. It's got a lot of variables and artifact that could throw off your reading. Oxygen needs to happen, but not too much oxygen. Why not? Oxygen in high doses causing hyperoxia can vasoconstrict. So let me guess. Got a clot here. Only this much room left. You give them oxygen, what happens? Do, 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 do. Makes it smaller. Is that good for them? No. So I'm looking for like a 94 to a 98%. Anything above that is too much. I'd start with a cannula and probably stay at like one, two liters per minute. Just to have those free radicals and more concentration going, I'd monitor the O2 set. Aspirin first, then oxygen. 12 lead immediately. Get you an IV. Nitro can happen, but for you, the paramedic, I want a 12 lead first. Why? I ain't trying to give nitro to an inferior MI. I don't want to bottom them out. I want to make sure that the right corner is not the one being affected right now. So before I give nitro, I got an IV. I've got a 12 lead. Also, I'm going to ask them that question. So let you, the expert, tell me about it. Question. Yeah, what question would you ask a male that's having chest pain before you give oh, nitro? So you know, sexual enhancement drug, erectile dysfunction medication. I figured you know it. You are older, seasoned. Erectile dysfunction. Yeah, erectile dysfunction. So you want to ask that question, because if they have taken any within the last 24 hours, it can kill them. Finish him. Sonya Blade wins. So we want to make sure that's not happening. And then we can talk about the fentanyl administration. But why are we giving pain meds? Well, think about if somebody's in pain, their heart rate goes up, right? If the heart rate's up, the heart is demanding more oxygen and the heart and the body can't really supply it right now. You give them pain meds. They don't feel the pain as much, so their heart rate will go down. The demand goes down. Not giving them fentanyl or pain meds can extend the infarct and make it worse. So take their pain away. You ain't got to knock them out, but just take it away. Give them a little bump. Woo! Well, dab will do you. So what about the MI? How do I know there's an evolution of the acute myocardial infarction? Well, the body and the EKG can, not always, but can tell me that there is an acute myocardial infarction going on. So how do I do that? Remember, not all MIs will display EKG changes, but the ones that do will look a little something like, listen to the song that All right. A, we're looking at pre-infarct territory. The upslope of that QRS, that J point, is starting to move up. So the ST part, because look, we got the QRS complex there. QRS, the S. And that T wave is starting to elevate. Even one block, even one block on your EKG graph paper is significant if it's in congruent leads. What does congruent leads mean? It means leads that have the same geography as each other. So I'll give you an example. Leads 2, 3, AVF are all looking at the inferior portion of the heart. So they're congruent leads. So if there's a one block of elevation in leads 2 and 3, that is significant, indicating there's a possible inferior myocardial infarction occurring. 
It is significant. So going from A to B, there is a lift of maybe one, of maybe one block. Now let's look at C. My guy over here. Wow. Is that a significant ST elevation? Yes, he's approaching what we call um, tombstone territory. You've heard of tombstone EKG? This is a pretty much electrocardiogram pattern that an ST segment elevation where the QRS complex, the ST segment, they resemble tombstones. And they merge to form one giant upright monophasic um, deflection called a tombstone. It has got a very poor prognosis. So it's called tombstone because it looks like one, but it also because why? Usually because they get a tombstone with it. Because they die. So moving to number D here, we have tall T wave ST elevation elevated. We got injury occurring over here in the D area. Now this is D. T wave is inverting here, showing that there's actually tissue death. We go to E now, right over here, where we have Q wave. Now the Q wave is the Q wave here. Look, it's starting to dip down. Now, the Q wave is a permanent marking indicating what? That there's dead meat there. Does dead meat beat? No. It's death of the tissue. So Q wave does not beat. As the MI resolves and we return to a normalcy here, we will have a patient develop a pathological Q wave, which is the QRS. The Q wave dips down farther. That's how you know somebody's had a previous MI. Previous MI. You remember how to read a 12 lead, don't you? I see all leads. Inferior wall, septal wall, anterior wall, then lateral wall. Now, let's be honest with each other, though. There's not a guarantee that just because I got ST elevation that it's actually an MI. There's a ton of other reasons there that there, they could have that type of ectopy occurring in their EKG. There could be another reason why they got a big old T wave. They could have left ventricular hypertrophy. Why do they have bifurcated QRS complexes? Well, because there's a right bundle branch block. There's a lot of things going on here that we have to consider. So the EKG is a good diagnostic, but it's not perfect and it's not always correct. But if you remember how to use the IC all leads mnemonic to read a 12 lead, this is the one that I taught you that we learned that we played with and the one that we are going to stick with at this point. So we talked about the treatment of the chest pain. We've talked about monofona. I don't want to have to beat that to death. Um, hypertensive emergencies. Well, most of the time we don't really treat hypertensive emergencies in the field. Here in Georgia, anyway. So a crisis would be an uncontrolled hypertension that fluctuates and is unpredictable. Well, that was the problem with hypertension is it could cause flash pulmonary edema. Could also cause an aneurysm where the pipe bursts and breaks. It can also cause vision disturbances and just uncomfortableness to the patient. So hypertensive encephalopathy, what does that mean? So high blood pressure, encephalopathy is any disease structure or process that interferes with the normal functioning of the brain. So with that, the treatment would be around nitro, morphine, finnegan, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers to bring that pressure down to a manageable, to a manageable yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the things that the patient would experience would be headache and nausea. If your blood pressure is that high, you'll have headache and nausea. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, the pressure is what's making it go to throw up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would think it has something to do with actually attacking the pressure versus treating the nausea and volume. So they have, they have, right? Both those medicines have the effect of lowering the blood pressure, right? So that would stop filling up. Well, Fenagran works a little kind of different. It also is a sedative in some cases. So Fenagran itself, acting like Benadryl with an antihistamine, you can take, start taking away some of the pain from it, take sleeping. Um, and also have the same aspect of basically removing the feeling that you need to keep up. But they don't have anything to do with blocking it. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think it's going to lower the blood pressure. That's just for the nausea. But think about what happens if you are vomiting. 
You ever you ever tried to vomit or cough and your head hurt? You're increasing the pressure and all this. You don't want that, so knock that nausea out. What about a triple A? Are we talking about you know what they give old people? Yeah, yeah, you would know. Okay, that's AARP. Oh, my bad. Uh, AARP. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to mess up your AARP it's membership. It's it's okay. AAA is <laughs> So AAA, pretty bad, right? Yeah. yeah. You could be on a surgeon's table and still die if you have a AAA. Results from arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis, which is plaque buildup. So they'll present with abdominal pain, back and flank pain. They will state it feels like a tearing sensation. They'll have low blood pressure and they'll have the urge to go poop because that retroperitoneal leak is the blood is actually falling down and it's causing them to have that urge to poop. So let's take a look. Ooh. Well, that'll get you. You'll know if it's burst, if it's ruptured, they'll be dead. But if it's leaking, they'll have a lower blood pressure. How can I continue to confirm it? Why would I take blood pressures on both arms? Well, think about the aorta flowing down here. It's got to go feed these brachiocephalic arteries and stuff. So if there's a leak on one side, you'll notice it. You'll notice a big change in blood pressure. Mm. So we talked about congestive heart failure. Right-sided occurs if the heart can't pump enough blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. Failure of the right ventricle may result or occur because the left side has occurred. So let me translate. The number one cause of right side of heart failure is left side of heart failure. The number one cause of left side of heart failure is an MI, a heart attack. Right side of heart failure is dry lungs. Left side of heart failure is wet lungs. Right side of heart failure will have what? Pulmonary hypertension. We'll have ascites, which is a big water belly, uh, pedal edema, JVD. You could have a presentation of the hepatojugular reflex, which is you can push on the liver and watch their JVD pop up. Ooh, that's fun. Look at that. All right, I've played with patients before. I like watching it. It's funny. <laughs> Look at that funny. Look at it bounce. <laughs> I am. So left side, we got a decreased stroke volume, which means that is the amount of blood coming out of the left ventricle is decreased because it's doing what? Reverting back to the lungs. Pulmonary hypertension and congestion, pulmonary edema. There's fluid in the alveolar sacs. They can't breathe. Also, they get dyspnea with exertion. Anytime they exert themselves, they get tired. Orthopnea, ortho meaning positional. So they have positional difficulty breathing and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. They cannot lay flat and sleep. This is because Peepaw has to sleep in his recliner now. Or he has to sleep with like 10 pillows underneath him. So what's the fix? Blood Reposition. Repositioning. O2. What else? Nitro to reduce the workload on the heart. What else? CPAP, CPAP, CPAP if, when, and why. If they're not. And the blood pressure is, uh, blood pressure is high enough. All right. What's uh, high enough? Not an ultimate test. Uh, need more secrets to start it. Blood pressure is over 100 systolic. Well, we can we can drop we can drop the CPAP on them, but they can't. They it's not going to breathe for them. They have to be able to yeah. breathe on their own. Nope, no alter mental status, no vomiting, none of that. And lastly, they got to be able to tolerate it. CPAP is very um, invasive. They are a little claustrophobic. You're going to have to talk to them. Hey, this is going to save your life. Please keep this on. Please keep this on. It helps when I put one on first and then I put one on the patient. And then we know? Yeah. You know Look, that. I can do it. That's a big like that, Larry. You turn it out. With the use of morphine or fentanyl or something like that, it will relax the patient. It will be as freaked out by the idea of feedback. That again. Not using morphine or fentanyl, they're basically not enough where it's not going to have a pain of having to work of breathing, uh, which will calm down the patient. I don't want to give blood pressure. You got to keep them up over. I wouldn't mess with morphine at all, but fentanyl can knock out the rest of the drive. It is a narcotic. I'd probably swing towards burst set if I'm going to do anything because that's a sedative. Hey, calm down. It's all good. You know what? I don't even care. I can't breathe anymore. This is cool. You know, this is fine. Everything's good.
So if you want to go that route, I personally would push more towards a verse head. But there's no protocol for that. So I'd probably call for orders. Hey, I need to calm this guy down so we can take the CPAP. Do you want me to give verse said just a touch? 2.5, let him let it ride. So depending on the patient that's nitro, uh, a pressure of some sort, depending if the blood pressure is too low to get CPAP done. You want to, you don't want to waste time getting that you gotta fix the demon time. Well, if you can't if the blood pressure is too low, you can't see that if the pressure on it increase the blood pressure enough to make you go to CPAP. CPAP. Like or so chronotropic will be time. I know is inotropic is strength. Strength. And dromotropic will be electrical conduction velocity. Okay. How do those with the left side and the right side and heart failure? How do those playing at night? Well, think about the heart failing, right? It doesn't have the the real juice to kind of pump and meet the demands of the body. So I'm just giving it some some chemicals to, hey, man, get it together, buddy. Beat harder. Beat faster. Beat stronger. Beat longer. You're in the good hands, people. And then if I rescue. He needs a new heart. You can't provide that on scene unless you have a willing volunteer at the Gateway Center. So you're just going to augment what he would normally have if his heart was working fine, which is you're going to use chemicals to stimulate him. And the chemicals we give, dopamine, norepi, epinephrine, they're all hormones that occur naturally in the body, but you're given synthetic versions of them, but they're bioidentical so they can activate the same receptors. And boost it. And boost it. Make sense? If it doesn't say something, this is your day. You're here, man. Let's, let's make it work. I can't say things like I'll leave the 99 for the one Got it? Feeling good? Well, explain it back to me then. Which part? All of it. So, some sort of trauma to the heart, whether it be an MI, is going to cause left sided heart failure. Okay, congestive heart failure. I like it. Okay. Having left sided heart failure untreated, let go, is going to cause right sided heart failure. Yeah. You know, uh, signs of that, pitting edema. You know, uh, difficulty breathing, hypotension, uh, buildup of fluid. So, okay. but if you get to left sided heart failure first, no, no pitting edema, no hypotension, left sided heart failure is just going to be basically um, support and transport, right? Kind of like monetary ABCs. I mean, if vital signs are within normal. It look, kind of depends on their presentation, whether you support or you really just um, augment the blood pressure or you just assist them. When somebody calls you for a congestive heart failure exacerbation, they're probably going to have have trouble yeah. breathing or chest pain. They're already in right side. Or, or both. They're already in left-sided heart failure. Right, but when they make the call, though, is that exacerbated into right-sided? No, it's just exacerbated left heart failure. It's just left heart failure at that point. And how are we going to treat that? So if they're having trouble breathing, their lungs are wet and their blood pressure is good, CPAP. If their blood pressure falls and they're now in cardiogenic shock, secondary to CHF, we'll give them a presser, Levofed, dopamine, or Epidrip to bring that pressure up. And then we'll uh, probably give them nitro if the pressure is good enough and the nitro will make the, the workload on the heart decrease and allow more blood flow to flow to it. Other than that, it's just set them up high. That's it. So look, you got it knocked out. How's everybody feeling? Hypertrophy means? Hypertrophy. So it means the abnormal growth or enlarged. Enlarged. Yeah. So... Well, cardiomegaly is enlarged heart, but um, enlarged muscles. Yeah. True. So atrophy is the shrinkage of the cells, making that area Hyper smaller. Trophy. Hypertrophy makes it yeah. bigger. Yeah. So that brings me to the next point where cardiogenic shock is what can occur if CHF is left untreated or if it just graduates to a worse problem. 
but other types of issues can cause it. Impaired MI, left ventricular emptying problems, tension pneumothorax, tamponades, and trauma, cardiac contusion could cause cardiogenic shock. It's pretty much shock because the heart is impaired by some mechanism. So blood pressure is lower than 80, respiratory stress, chest pain, hypotension, tachycardia. <clears throat> so what do you need? Rapid transport, position of comfort, O2, treat underlying problems, IV access, consider positive inotropes and vasopressors. So something to make the heart beat harder and to squish the arteries up by alpha receptors and bring that blood pressure skyrocketing back up. All right, tamponade. We got Beck's triad being the evidence-based way of figuring it out. So we got jugular vein distension, muffled heart tones, and hypotension. The way you treat a pericardial synthesis in the field is what? You can give a tiny fluid bolus to make the heart beat a little harder, but it's only going to buy them time. What do they really need is a pericardial synthesis. Somebody needs to stab a needle in their heart sac and suck juice out. Had you ever had to do this in the field? No, they we couldn't do that by the time I was made a paramedic. Paramedics used to could do this in the field, but now they can't because some cowboys in here just stabbing people in the heart like Dracula or something. <laughs> 